Hello and welcome to the TradeShift Sanctuary here in Davos, Switzerland, where TradeShift and CNBC have partnered to bring a week's worth of content programming during the World Economic Forum 2017. My name is Travis Bickham, and I'm here with Stuart Russell, Professor of Computer Science at the ESTEEM University of California, Berkeley. Go Bears. <laughs> Go Bears indeed. And today we're going to be exploring the intersection of the theme this week, which is responsive and responsible leadership, and of course your area of expertise, artificial intelligence. So I think uh, we'll just start off very broad. Uh, how did you first get into artificial intelligence and what's that journey been like? Uh, so we started actually about 40 years ago. Um, I was in high school and a nearby college started a computing program and they asked for students to volunteer as guinea pigs for that. Um, and as soon as I found out what a computer was, uh, I wanted to make it intelligent. <laughs> so I, I wrote a chess program um, and a few other things. I didn't realize at that time that you could actually study artificial intelligence as an academic subject. So I became a physicist, uh, but then I switched to computer science. I went to a university that's near Berkeley, across the <laughs> bay, uh, but we usually try it not- It shall not be named. It shall not be named. Um, uh, and did my PhD there and then moved to Berkeley after that. Um, but it's always struck me that these are the two most important questions. How does the universe work? Uh, and how does intelligence work? Fantastic. And then thinking about that journey and where we are now in 2017, of course, artificial intelligence is hugely important, both to society and business. Um, if you could look back all those years, are you surprised at where we are now? Uh, yes, I think I am. Um, there have been times in the history of the field where uh, it wasn't all that popular. Uh, we had something called the AI winter in the late 80s, early 90s, um, after the failure of the expert system industry. Um, and at that time, you know, there were 20 students taking my class, uh, and it looked like a, a very, very long, steep <laughs> hill to climb to get to, uh, to get to real capabilities that people would, right. would use in practice. Um, you know, and now uh, there's 650 students taking the class, um, and AI is being used for all kinds of things, and we are, we are knocking over problems one after the other that uh, have been worked on for 40 or 50 years, uh, and now they are being solved. So recognition of objects, uh, you know, robots being able to walk like, like sort of normal people mm -hmm. as opposed to robots. Right. Um, uh, speech understanding uh, is another important problem that's pretty much solved now. So those are really important steps. There's still uh, perception and motor. It's the, the core of cognition uh, still has some mysteries for us. Um, but if you had asked me 10 years ago where we would be now, I'd say we're further ahead uh, than I would have expected. Wow. And uh, thinking about kind of cracking those mysteries as we go forward over the next five, 10 years and beyond, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the progress we're gonna make? Well, it, I mean, if you ask the Hollywood movie directors or many journalists who, <laughs> who put Terminator robots into every single article about AI, um, you know, I'm going to wake up and, you know, my laptop will decide that it hates me and, and <laughs> blow up in my face or something. Uh, so there are some real problems. AI is going to be possibly the most important technology that ever happened, uh, except possibly fire, which otherwise, without which we might not be here at all. But, right. But it's a pretty high AI, bar to say. AI, you know, the, the access to greater levels of intelligence than we've ever had uh, can only be a step change in civilization. So it's going to be an incredibly powerful technology. And like any powerful technologies, we could, we could screw up, right? We could, uh, we could use it to kill each other with autonomous weapons. Um, and there is a concern that if we don't understand, we, if, if we are more successful in building it than we are in learning how to control it, uh, then just like with a nuclear power station, if you don't have the fail safes mm -hmm. and the control mechanisms, then uh, bad things can happen. And with AI, the bad things means uh, intelligent systems that are uh, capable of acting on a global scale, as, for example, uh, stock trading software is already capable of acting on a global scale and causing global collapses as, as it right. has already. Um, so when you get out into the real world, we could have real consequences if we don't understand how to control the system. Absolutely. Um, but I think 
you know, there are technical solutions that are starting to appear. Um, there is now very serious research on trying to solve these problems, and I'm optimistic that will succeed. So, uh, so it's in our hands, and if we get it right, then um, the future looks very bright because AI can help us solve the problems that we are too stupid to solve by ourselves. <laughs> you know, disease, poverty, warfare, climate change. Um, these are really important and we have to solve them. And AI can help. And with anything that powerful, there's of course a ton of opportunity as you just referenced. I think you touched on that a little bit right there, but thinking of you know, both society as a whole, us as the human race, and also business in particular, uh, you know, international corporations, what is the biggest area for potential impact? So I think one that's already clear is the self-driving car. So that transportation is a six or seven trillion dollar industry. Um, so it makes, you know, so Google operates in, in the ad world, which is maybe 800 billion or something total worldwide, you know, if, if Google is able to get their self-driving car to market first, you know, then they're operating in a, a 10 times larger space than they were. Um, that could revolutionize you know, life in cities. Um, it could make life so much easier for people. It'll make transportation uh, available in a way that's almost free. I mean, journeys that right now might cost $20 you know, will cost 75 cents. Um, and so transportation becomes a free good for everybody, uh, and that can only be a good thing. And what do you feel like that could mean for the shipping and logistics industry, or you know, large companies that are really heavily hardware focused right now because they need to actually move goods around the globe? Will that become much cheaper, and will that get passed along to society? So I think the costs in uh, in shipping uh, are largely in the capital equipment because you know if you want to pick up a forty ton container and, and move it around. You need massive cranes, and these things cost tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. So, so the labor component uh, is actually quite small. Um, so I wouldn't, uh, and I would say the, you know, the container shipping industry is already very efficient. Ports, the port of Singapore, for example, is almost completely automated. Uh, you know, so ships arrive with 400, 800 containers. They're all offloaded automatically. They're moved around. They're put onto trucks uh, with no human beings in, uh, involved. Wow. So already. it's, it's, already, it's yeah. already there, right. and that's one of the reasons why international trade uh, has become um, so important and that why we can buy goods from across the world, you know, whatever it might be, strawberries or, mm -hmm. or um, toys or anything that, that costs only a few cents more than they would if you bought them uh, next door. And kind of tying that into the Internet of Things, is it possible then, you know, those strawberries could be ordered by your fridge as it realizes it's starting to run out? <laughs> you know, what does all that look like as we tie it together? Well, I, I think after self-driving cars, the next really big application of AI is going to be uh, the intelligent personal assistant. And that can be everything from, you know, something that lives on your smartphone, uh, like in the movie Her, where it listens to all your conversations, it reads right. all your emails, it knows everything about you, enough to actually help you day to day, and that, that requires understanding language, uh, which is starting to happen, but is still a difficult problem. Um, but when that happens, uh, you know, everyone will have access to a high-class executive assistant that would right now cost them $150,000 a year uh, for 99 cents a month. Um, and a lot of people who really need the help uh, will be able to get it. Um, and then, you know, it could take the form of the smart home, the smart fridge, mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, ordering strawberries when you're out of strawberries only makes sense if you're going to be in the house that week, uh, you know, and if the kids right. are in the mood that they like strawberries this week mm -hmm. and so on. So, um, again, understanding the context of your human life is essential to being actually useful to you. <clears throat> and that's been, the, that's been the failing of many of these automated systems. I mean, you know what? We have simple thermostats that, that turn on and off at seven in the morning, they go off at nine in the evening, um, but they don't know that you're away on vacation. You have to manually intervene mm -hmm. to do that. But a real smart home would already, you know, they'd know your airline schedule. Right. And they'd say, well, of course they're gonna be away. Look, there's all four of them and they're flying, they're flying off to Davos, so sure. they're not home. And they're calling a cab to come pick you up on the way back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that that's a really, really good segue when you look at that gap between, you know, what 
potentially could happen in the future and where we are now. And that ties into this theme of responsive and responsible leadership here at the World Economic Forum. How can we be responsible leaders when it comes to artificial intelligence? And what steps do we have to take to make sure it's applied appropriately? Uh, so in the near term, I would say the autonomous weapons question is the one that really needs leadership um, because we are, we are moving along towards an arms race. Uh, both the US and Russia and China are all talking about how this is going to be an important part of their, their armed forces. Uh, and not much thought is being given to the consequences of creating that kind of technology, which is really a weapon of mass destruction because any number of weapons can be launched by you know, a small fixed number of people, which, which makes it a weapon of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. You can use 10 million weapons or 50 million weapons against an entire country uh, with only five guys and a few trucks. Right. Uh, so that's, that's something where we need leadership at the highest level. Um, and I think the ethical consequences of AI, as, as I mentioned, they can be very significant for the human race. And I'm very happy to see, for example, that the five uh, the five big IT companies uh, have joined together to form a partnership on AI, uh, and they've enunciated some very clear principles uh, about how AI systems are to be designed so that they're safe, so that they're uh, you know, unbiased against groups of people, and so on. Um, so those are all good signs. Um, but there is, a, there is a thread still within the AI community that uh, doesn't want to discuss any question of, of risks or negative outcomes because they feel that's maybe bad, bad public relations mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, you know, and I'm reminded of the nuclear industry, which had a big PR campaign in the 50s and 60s that you know, although yeah, nuclear weapons did kill 200,000 people in, in Japan, another 100,000 people have died of fallout, uh, really nuclear, nuclear stuff is good for you. Uh, there's no risk. There's right, you're no, supposed to glow like that. There, there is, there's no, right, there's no risk. There's, there's, yeah. there's no nuclear waste. There's no, there's mm -hmm. no possible danger. And then, you know, that, that led to a culture that led to Chernobyl. And that destroyed the nuclear industry. And then we lost all the benefits of, of pollution-free electricity. Uh, you know, we could have been in a much better situation with regard to uh, carbon dioxide had they taken the risks much more seriously and been much more open about it. So, um, so I think we'll reach an equilibrium uh, instead of having uh, this sort of raucous debate where some people are you know, putting Terminator robots in every article and the media are overstating the imminent risk, because this is not an imminent risk, right? You know, my, my laptop isn't going to wake up and decide <laughs> it hates me. Uh, but on the other side, this is a very conservative reaction within uh, the AI community saying, you know, trust us, we're the experts, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing to worry about, uh, AI is only good for you, uh, <laughs> and so on. Um, AI is a super powerful technology, maybe, as I said, the, the, the biggest technological event in the history of mankind. So of course, uh, it has to be managed carefully. And who should ultimately be the arbiter of what is and is not appropriate? Is that a job for the government? Should that be a coalition between the public and the private space? And then how do we go about getting there? So that's a great question. And there, there are many analogies in, in other areas. So, so think about bridges, for example. Right? We drive across bridges every day, and we don't even think about it. Um, there was probably a time when, you know, if you'd driven a heavy truck across an old stone bridge, you might well have ended up in the river because right. uh, they didn't know how to build them very mm -hmm. well. So it's been a, a gradual development of, of the science, right? The, this, the, the science of structures and statics, mm -hmm. um, of industry standards and of government regulation. The government can't impose a regulation until they know what to say, right? They say, build it like this. So mm -hmm. what is this? Well, at the moment, we don't know what this is for AI systems that are provably safe. So it's up to the scientific community to figure out how do you build uh, a piece of software that is guaranteed not to do things that make you unhappy. Uh, that's a very difficult question because sure. we don't even know how to write down what makes us happy or unhappy. There are a few things that are clear, but then you always forget something, you know, like King Midas forgot right. uh, that he, did, he didn't want everything to turn to gold. Mm -hmm. he, just, he just meant, you know, like the right. furniture, but he <laughs> wanted the food and the relatives to, to stay intact. Um, 
So that problem of misspecification of objectives is, uh, in my view, and in fact, this is a view going back uh, at least to Norbert Wiener in 1960, um, that that's the problem uh, with achieving superintelligent machines is, is we don't know how to specify the objectives for them. So the answer seems to be that um, the obligation is on the machine to work out cooperatively with the human what it is that the human really wants, uh, rather than just to assume that whatever the objective the human gives them is in fact the right one, right? You want, you know, so King Minus's robot should have said, well, are you sure you mean everything turned to right. gold? Yeah. Right. No, don't, how about this? You know, you point to something and say abracadabra, make it gold and I'll make it gold. But mm -hmm. other than that, we'll leave it up, we'll leave it. Right, developing that synergistic relationship. Yeah, exactly. And in, and in mathematical terms, we call this game theory. And, and mm -hmm. this is the theoretical framework that we're actually working in and, and starting to have results that we can, we can build AI systems that are provably beneficial to the user. Uh, and, and if that line of research turns out to succeed, then there'll be, there'll be a template and the scientific community can agree that this is a safe template. And then the government regulations would say, if you're putting a system out there that can connect with the web, for example, uh, just like we say, you know, if you're putting a car on the public roads, you know, it has to have uh, turn signals, you know, it mm -hmm. has to have brakes, right? We, same thing. If you're putting it on the web, it has to conform to certain standards. Um, and I think a big test case early on um, is going to be the intelligent personal assistant because that is going to live on the web and it will be empowered to, to make financial transactions on your behalf and oh. to, uh, you know, to ask questions of other intelligent mm -hmm. agents around the world and send information. So, you know, I don't want my intelligent personal assistant, you know, some other one says, oh, can you tell me uh, Stuart's passwords? And it says, sure, here they are, you know, right? <laughs> right, you know, right? You don't want that kind of thing. You know, I don't want it, you know, buying stuff that I can't afford and then mm -hmm. not paying, defaulting. And there's all kinds of things you don't want it to do. Um, and we will have to figure out the rules of the road so that uh, things go well. Um, and it hasn't worked that well in the, uh, in the stock markets, right? The, the rule of the road is uh, if things start to go south, switch everything off. Right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the rules of the road. Um, and that kind of works in the stock market, which is uh, you know, a closed system. They can undo the transactions that have occurred, sort of rewind uh, by 10 minutes, uh, you know, reset all the algorithms and, right. and start again. But, but out there in the real world, you know, with self-driving cars or with enormous networks of, of, uh, of unregulated personal assistants doing stuff, uh, it would be impossible to do that. And then last question, I want to finish up with a chance for you to do a little bit of fortune telling. Mm -hmm. Next year, when we're sitting here in Davos, what's going to be the biggest breakthrough of 2017? Well, um, so from my point of view, I, so I'm an academic researcher. I work within a university, and we tend not to think in terms of breakthroughs, right? Because the research operates in a continuous flow, um, and from time to time, uh, we cross certain thresholds where a new capability becomes good enough that it works out there in the real world. So speech recognition, people worked on it for decades. It suddenly becomes good enough to work on a cell phone, and now billions, billions mm -hmm. of people have it. And we think of that as a breakthrough, but in fact, it was just the result of, of decades of accumulated research uh, and expertise. You know, people talk about AlphaGo as a breakthrough, mm -hmm. um, but you know, AlphaGo is based on an algorithm going back to 1957. Uh, you know, it was an incredible engineering achievement. Uh, it pulled together a number of innovations that have happened uh, over all those years since 1957. Um, but it in itself is a demo of where we are. Uh, and that was, that's, that's impressive to people outside because they hadn't been following. They didn't know where we were. They didn't think that was going to be possible, uh, and it was. Uh, so what kinds of amazing demos might we see? Um, so we may see the first commercially sold fully autonomous uh, vehicle. You know, Tesla was, Tesla, uh, perhaps autopilot was a bit of a, Misnomer, uh, I mean, it was, it's a step, it's a part yeah. of autonomous driving, but right. fully autonomous driving really means you ought to be able to sit in the back seat or I should be able to you know, send my kid to school mm -hmm. um, in the car and have it come back with pizza. Um, 
And that's a really difficult task. I think there's a chance we might see that uh, from a very ambitious manufacturer. Uh, I know that you know, this is a huge race going on because the stakes you know, are in the trillions if you, win, if you win that race. Um, we might see the first person killed in conflict by a fully autonomous weapon. On the downside, that would be very unfortunate. Um, the progress in machine learning is really incredible. Um, it, it's, we, we're seeing significant things happening on a monthly basis. Um, and I think the next big thing that we could see is, is a form of true natural language understanding. Right now, we sort of have very superficial mapping from strings of words to classifications of documents or translations. But we may see uh, true forms of natural language understanding where there is really a f you know, forming of internal representations of the, the content such that you can really answer questions against a very large corpus of text. That would be um, a major breakthrough. Uh, you know, it'll make search engines completely obsolete. Um, it'll create functionalities. You know, search engines is one trillion dollar industry, right? right? If, you can, if you could understand all those hundreds of billions of web pages, not just index them, but actually understand them and integrate that information, you know, it, it has to be worth 10 times the search engine industry. So mm -hmm. that, would be, uh, that would be a major step. Well, truly some exciting things that could potentially be happening, as you said, not just in 2017, but in the next few years. So I want to thank you, Stuart. This has been extremely illuminating. We're here uh, in Davos, Switzerland at the Trade Shift Sanctuary. And I want to thank you for coming by. Pleasure. Very nice talking to you.